Father, just pray for your Holy Spirit once again to be with everyone and to help me not to be so emotional. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for doing for me, for doing for all of us what we cannot do for ourselves. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I wanted to start off by saying because of the, the subject matter of my story, it's, it's a, a story of deliverance from intense darkness. But I want everybody to know up front that I am a blessed man. I have a wonderful wife of 23 years, two wonderful sons, and I've had the privilege of working for three different ministries, a, a drama ministry in California, and two international ministries out of Tennessee that have an emphasis on outreach to the unreached of the world. Probably one of the most fulfilling moments of my life was spending a week at an orphanage in India with all these awesome kids. I've shared my story through the years one-on-one -on -one with people, and typically, I don't get emotional, but it was a few weeks ago at Nicole and Andy's where Nicole asked me to share completely unexpectedly, and it was kind of hard. I couldn't look at anybody. What I went through the first part of my life was incredibly depressing, and that's why I wanted to start it with something positive, and at the end, I have something positive. And you know it has a happy ending, but in between the first, the first half, it's a miracle that I even survived. Anyway, I wanted to tell you that uh, just a few weeks ago, it was really crazy. You know, here I've been working on this, and then out of the blue, you get this message. And the message basically was from my cousin that I haven't talked to in probably 10 years. And she reaches out to me and she says, there's this woman who has submitted a DNA test to Ancestry and just wondered if you know anything about her. Well, interestingly enough, this woman was born in 1945 in a home for unwed mothers in the same city where my mother and father were married six months later. Her birth name had the same maiden name as my mother, and the middle name was the first name of my mother's mother, who died when my mother was just 16 years old of breast cancer at the age of 40. Very interesting coincidence. The long and the short of it is, this lady is my half-sister. To live as long as I have lived, and then find out, out of the blue, you've got a sister. And I truly can't get over the resemblance that she bears to my mother. She doesn't see it. Anyway, she grew up as an only child, and she always wished that she had siblings. So this was definitely a shock. But it was a pleasant shock for me, because I thought, wow. the prospect of having a sister who might love me, unlike the sisters that I grew up with. So in this journey, I've come to know some things about my mother's background that I never knew. I've lived all my life, never had a clue. There were so many secrets. And as you hear the story, you'll understand why there were so many secrets. But I never knew anything about my mother's background. That evening, sending messages back and forth with my cousin, I came to learn that she grew up in an abusive home. I never heard anything about my grandfather, and I was always told, well, both your grandfathers were dead before you were born. Well, interestingly, I found out that her dad died four years after my birth, so didn't know. So when my grandmother died, she left a husband behind with six children. But apparently he was a heavy drinker and was abusive to the family. And the other explosive secret I found out is that he was a high-ranking mason, a 32-degree mason. These are just some pieces that have been added 
to the puzzle. I spent years trying to make sense of my childhood. And before I go into the nitty gritty, the, the gruesome details, I want to say that it wasn't until I came to learn about the great controversy between good and evil that for the first time I had somewhat of an understanding of why I went through what I went through. Obviously, Satan hates Jesus. He hates the human race, and I think he especially hates children because children bear a closer resemblance to the purity of the Father. And I believe that Satan, before he begins the process of destroying, the sooner he gets that process started, the more likely that those children or those people will not turn towards God or become shipwrecks of humanity. So the first phone call came with my new sister. And it was exciting. I was, I was also apprehensive because of some of the questions that she was going to have about our mother. You know, I obviously didn't want to tell her what I went through, because what I went through was unique to only me. My other three siblings were treated wonderfully. So anyway, I just thought, wow, what do I say if she asks about my mother? So the first thing she said is, well, at least you grew up with siblings. How do I answer this question? So that's when I just said, well, I might as well have been an orphan. She says, what do you mean? And I said that my mother hated me from the time I was four. This is not what you want to learn about your birth mother that you're just discovering. Typically, this picture would be true for most people, but not for everyone. Mother's Day was always hard, finding a card. Her birthday was always hard. I couldn't get any of the cards about how, what a wonderful mother you are. And no matter what she did, I always loved her and I forgave her. But I told my new sister that day on the phone call, I said most likely she would have loved you as much as she loved her other three children. I didn't have the heart to tell her, to share with her what I'm going to share with you today. So I've always believed that if this is true, for it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, if that is true for those of us who have chosen Christ, chosen his ways to follow him, I believe the opposite can also be true for those who don't choose him. I would like to propose that the reason why child abuse and spousal abuse and abuse in all its forms is so rampant in our world is that very reason. That if you haven't chosen Christ, that you are vulnerable to be unwittingly used by God's enemy to have his evil will and his evil pleasure done in and through you. I don't say this to excuse my mother or to excuse anybody else, but obviously all of us here know we live in a broken world with broken people, and the only solution is Jesus. He's our only source of healing. So this is my mother that was before she got married, shortly after she might have had my half-sister. Anyway, my siblings, as I've already alluded to, didn't really have the same mother. The mother they had was very loving, so it was really like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde scenario. And the treatment I received at her hands pretty much was demonic. And I know those are pretty harsh words to use about anybody, especially one's own mother. Nobody witnessed some of the darkest moments 
only Christ. Of course, I didn't know that then. And I'm only sharing some of the details to highlight the depths of the hopelessness from which God had to deliver me. So one of the hardest uh, assignments I've ever been given next to standing here in front of you today was I took a digital imaging class in college about 12 years ago. And the final assignment was to do a movie poster of the story of your life. Oh no. I just thought anything but that. The purpose of the long shadow, I wanted to illustrate that no matter how dark, no matter how hopeless, your experience has been the power of the cross. It's the most powerful weapon in the universe, God's love. He sees you. He can reach you. And if he did it for me, he can do it for anyone. And I guarantee you, without his intervention in my life, I wouldn't have lived to the age of 20. There's no way. So it was his revelation of his love for me because of that, that I live to tell the story. And my story is one of billions who have experienced trauma in this fallen world. And parts of my stories I've already told you are pretty disturbing. And I could sugarcoat them and say it was all wonderful, but I would be lying to you and I would be lying to myself. My first memory, when I was about four years old, I um, had to be in my room for my afternoon nap. And under no circumstances was I allowed out of the room. And you know, when you're that little, everything is really big. The door is really big. The people are really big. And I couldn't contain myself any longer. And I defecated on the floor. And I remember the door opening. I remember my mother being angry. And the next thing I know, there's a hand on the back of my neck. <sighs> pushing my head down like you would to a dog. Another memory that I have, uh, I think I was about five, and I don't know what had just happened, but I was in the bathtub, my mother was there, and whatever happened, I said, when dad gets home, I'm going to tell. And she said, if you do, I will leave. I have no idea what happened. All I know is it terrified me. You know, what little child wants to hear their mother say, I'm, I'll leave? And so that uh, frightened me into submission for the next 10 years. So I didn't tell anybody. And from that moment on, she did everything she could to prevent a relationship from developing between my father and I. And of course, this was to protect her. And sadly, she did succeed. For all intents and purposes, I never did have a relationship with my dad. I learned more about him after he died than I knew about him while he was alive. Quite messed up. On more than one occasion, I remember her digging her fingers into my shoulders and through clenched teeth with her head shaking, she would tell me how ugly I was how stupid I was and how much she hated me. The rules that I grew up with were not the typical rules of most children, and all of the rules were designed to keep me as far away from her as possible, to keep me out of her hair, and to protect her secret. My dad, as I already told you, spent a lot of time away from home. When he wasn't home, I wasn't allowed to eat supper with the family. I would eat downstairs in an unfinished basement. It felt like cruel and unusual punishment, so I remember I would try to sneak to go sit on the bottom step so I wouldn't feel so alone. Uh, here's some of the other rules. I wasn't allowed to play with other children in the, in the neighborhood. And of course, that was to protect her from being found out in the neighborhood. I wasn't allowed to come home after school until supper. When the supper was finished, then I had to go out and play. 
when I was home, I wasn't allowed to talk, wasn't allowed to pet the cat. Unlike my siblings, I never had a birthday party. For some weird reason, I wasn't allowed to have a toothbrush. Don't ask me why. And until I left home at the age of 17, she would stay in the bathroom until I undressed and got in the tub. And of course, the older I got, the more humiliating that became. I wasn't allowed to bring any friends home, and I remember one time violating the rule, and I brought a friend home, and he was just blown away with what a wonderful mother I had. I thought, wow, what an amazing performance she put on for him. Um, I wasn't allowed to draw, and this was something I really enjoyed. I enjoyed doing portraits uh, in pencil and pastel, and it was one of the only positive forms of attention I got at school. During art class, girls would line up at my desk to have their portrait done. Well, my brother, I think I was about 13 or 14, and he was going to be married, and I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money to buy a gift for him. So I did a pastel portrait of his wife-to-be. It was destroyed. I did another one. Thought I hit it. She found it. It was destroyed. Finally, I persevered, and I finally was able to do another one and present it to them. And I remember the glare on my mother's face, you know, when I gave it to them. You know, she, no one else knew the look like I knew the look, and it was only for me, but, oh, she wasn't happy. I wasn't allowed to talk to my father, and I remember this uh, one evening, um, my bedroom was on the opposite end of the basement as my father's office. And I remember sneaking, and I had to pass the, the doorway that led up the stairs. And as I walked past that doorway, I looked up, and I saw the shadow of my mother leaned over listening, listening to see you know, but it would be out of fear for her. Fear of, is Kirk going to talk to Johnny and tell Johnny what's going on? So she probably just lived literally on the edge all the time, so afraid. At home and at school, I was unwanted, abused, and bullied. I learned early how to outrun all the bullies that would pursue me. My dad used to say that I ran like a gazelle. Little did he know why I ran like a gazelle. So a few months ago, I reconnected with someone I hadn't talked to since elementary school days. And I asked him, do you remember how we met? And I was really taken aback by his response. He said, yeah, you were surrounded by about eight to 10 kids in the courtyard at recess who were harassing you. And my sister and I stepped in and put a stop to it. That just completely shocked me. And it makes me wonder how many other memories that I have forgotten or I have suppressed. My siblings learned by how my mother treated me, how to view me, how to treat me. When I was a child, I thought that I was the only one that was being affected, but I realize it's a ripple effect. You throw a pebble into a pond and it ripples. And sadly, what this did to my, quote, family, it was like a cancer, but it affected mostly me. But it did affect others. And many years later, my younger sister hadn't talked to me for a year. And I remember at the end of the year saying, I hope that never happens again. And she said, well, I can't promise you anything. I can't help but view you as a non-person. Hadn't heard it put quite so bluntly before. And then a number of years later, before my mother passed away, my older sister, I don't think her intent was malicious. I think her intent was to prepare me for the reality of what was coming. And she just basically said, Kirk, I just want you to know that when mother dies, I doubt we'll have anything to do with you after that. And they basically haven't. So one of the brightest rays in my childhood was 
meeting Stephen, I met him in grade one, and he had a form of epilepsy. He would sometimes have a seizure in the class, and of course, in grade one, you know how kids are, they would tease him brutally. So he didn't stay at the school I attended for much longer. I think they had to send him to a different school. But it was as a result of meeting Stephen and his family where I learned what maybe a normal, loving family was like. And it was also, more importantly, where I learned about Jesus. And so, as a little guy, I learned about Jesus that was really appealing to me because it gave me hope. But I, I used to think that I believed in Jesus since I was five. But in reality, I came to realize much later as an adult that really to believe in Jesus, you need to believe and receive his love. And that's something I couldn't do because I didn't even have a reference point for what, what that was. It sounded good. It sounded wonderful. But I'm really, really grateful for him and his family because they brought me in. They, they treated me with love. They treated me with love and respect. And little did all of us know that I would basically be going there for the next 10 years every day after school and pretty much every weekend. And I'm sure his mom and dad must have wondered you know, why, why doesn't this kid ever go home? But so, yeah, I was just going to say I was unable and didn't even know what love was. And that is a hard thing when your own mother doesn't love you. It's, it's almost impossible to believe that anyone can love you, especially a God that you can't see. But I loved the concept so at the age of five, when I learned about the existence of God, one of my first prayers was, God, please take my life. I also remember feeling angry that God would have allowed me to be born. And I remember finding a little brown bottle with skull and crossbones on it in the medicine chest. So I got a piece of white bread. I put a few drops on the piece of bread, but it turned black, so I thought, ah. So I chickened out, but in my heart, I see little five-year-olds. I just scratch my head now, and I think, I can't wrap my mind around a little five-year-old wanting to end his life. But anyway, that was me. I frequently attended church with Stephen and his family. And when they weren't available, sometimes I would venture off, I would sneak off to the United Church that was in our neighborhood, and that, of course, was taboo. I wasn't supposed to be anywhere in the neighborhood. And if my mom and sisters found out I had gone to church, they would tease me. In order to get rid of me on um, Saturdays, she would give me enough money for bus fare and enough money to go see a movie. So. I would go to a movie theater that wasn't in the greatest part of downtown that had double features. And if I liked the movie, I would stay and watch it twice. So that's eight hours in a movie theater, pretty much. And I would get on a bus, and I would either go home or I would go to Stephen's house. And if uh, Stephen's parents allowed it, my mother rarely hesitated allowing me to spend Friday night there she was even more delighted if it was Friday night and Saturday night. The less she saw of me, the better. There was, uh, I remember a Sunday morning, I don't know how old I was. It was in the midst of a Calgary winter, and those are brutal. And there was a blizzard. Didn't matter what the weather was. I had to go out and play, sub-zero. So that day... I got bundled up, and it seemed like it took an eternity in that cold. I got to Stephen's house, and no one was home. And then I tried to find another place where I could go, another friend, and to no avail. I couldn't find any place. So I remember sitting on a rock in the middle of a blizzard. When I was about 12, I met a young man at school whose family were Jehovah's Witnesses. And I spent about a year studying with his grandmother. And I was just about to be baptized, but then I came to this 
conclusion that their belief system was kind of futile. And so I canceled my baptism, and her response wasn't the response that a kid like me needed to hear, but it was like a death sentence. She said that I was doomed and there was no hope for me. For the grade nine year book, we were asked to provide what our pet peeve was that would be published next to our picture. My pet peeve read life. No one seemed to notice or care. In my first year of high school, I, fell in, I thought I fell in love. And I had heard that the girl that was the object of my affections was experimenting with drugs. And I naively thought that I could change that. That didn't happen. This actually began a, a very intense 13 year long battle with drugs. I tried just about every drug that I could get my hands on. Many of the drugs were known to turn teenagers into human vegetables, and many were known to have killed. By the time I reached grade 12, I was probably stoned every other day. How I graduated, don't ask me. And I started seeing a guidance counselor in school. I think it was about grade 11, and he advised me just to preserve my life that I should leave home. He was afraid if I stayed home, I would wind up killing myself. So uh, here I am, I'm in my room, finish my supper, my mother comes down to get my plate and to tell me to go out and play. And I said, Mom, I'm in high school now, I have homework, I can't go out and play. Didn't matter, had to go out and play. So I left. And I thought about it, and I thought, I'm going back, I'm going to pack up, I'm going to leave. My dad was away on a business trip as usual, so she was probably freaking out a little bit, because how is she going to explain this to him? So she comes down, and she asks me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm leaving. And she gave me the, what more could you ask for? You have a roof over your head, you have a meal, you have everything you need. And she basically alluded to it as being a home. And I said, this isn't a home for me. It's like a hotel. I check in, I check out. And I said, I thought a home was a place where some sort of love prevailed between the people in it. After I said that, first time I ever expressed it to her, but I told her I wished I had never been born. And to my amazement, she had this flash, just like, just a split-second flash of almost compassion or concern or shock, which shocked me that she could even be shocked that I would even express that. I mean, where have you been? Do you not understand how your actions affect people? But that night I went to Stephen's house and his parents were not happy. They weren't, they weren't displeased with me. They were displeased with what was going on in my home. And they threatened to report my mother. And I begged them, please do not. I promised I would be gone within two weeks. And I did find a room and board situation. I was so depressed. And I don't know how long this period was, if it was two months, six months. My drug of choice during that time was sleep. It was the ultimate escape from the misery of my life. Well, after this, my drug use escalated to its worst point. I was introduced to a drug that made life wonderful. And it got so bad that I was injecting up to 21 capsules a day into my veins. And at the end of a six-month period, it's like I walked by a mirror and I, it's like I saw my reflection for the first time. I think I weighed 120 pounds. It's the middle of summer. You know, I'm in the prime of life, 19 years old. And instead of having healthy complexion and, you know, a tan, my skin had a blue hue to it. I looked like death. I looked like a walking skeleton. And I think God must have used that moment to jolt me. And thankfully, I did stop injecting 
drugs into my veins at that point, but I didn't stop the other drugs. So it wasn't too long after that that I decided I did have to end it all. I took an overdose, and I recall regaining consciousness in the hospital, and I was quite angry that my plan had failed, and I was quite perplexed why so many of the, the nurses and doctors and orderlies that were coming in and out of my room seemed to have bruises. So one day I asked the nurse, and she said, well, that's because it took nine of us to hold you down when you came here. Which is hard to imagine, 120 pounds. So I think it must have been, it must have been the anger that I had. So a year after, my brother had had quite a bit to drink, and he never talked to me, so this was pretty rare that he was talking to me. And he told me that my mother and father just about had divorced at that time, which shocked me. And so the only thing that I could think was that it must have been based on what I told my dad when I was 14. When I was 14, for I don't know how it happened, but somehow my dad and I wound up in the house alone together. And I opened up to him about what had been going on since I was little. And he loved my mother a lot, and I think the love he had for her blinded him. And he really couldn't believe what I was telling him. In his estimation of all the babies, I was the most loved. Apparently, he used to playfully tease about how big my head was. And I guess my mother would get quite unhappy with him. So I think it was probably then that his eyes were open to the fact that my mother was a big part of why I was in the hospital. So he probably blamed her. Well, after being released, I wound up in a basement suite. And I don't know how it happened, but a young man from school started visiting me. It was literally like God had sent an angel. I'm not sure how long he visited. I think it was about three to four months. I'm not 100% sure. And I got a phone call from his fiancée that he had died. And this sent me over the edge again. And so I inflicted two very serious wounds upon myself. And uh, just before losing consciousness from loss of blood, I must have said this or thought it. But all I know is that I survived that is nothing short of a miracle because it would have taken stitches to have closed up the wounds. It didn't dawn on me at the time that this was a miracle. I used to pride myself that I had no anger towards my mother. But it was not until I was probably in my early 20s that I recognized, I came to know that suicidal tendencies is anger, instead of being turned out, turned in. By the way, the other thing that made that period of time so hard when Dean died, my friend Stephen had died just a few months before as well. So he had a seizure in a swimming pool at the age of 18 and drowned. So just one thing on top of another, it was, it was just really hard. So I had this brilliant idea. I'm still trying to figure out why, why I went through what I went through. So I thought, I'm going to go visit Stephen's mother, and I'm going to ask her. What was I like as a child? I mean, nobody would have known me better than her. And I just want to tell you, before I tell you her response, I was no angel. All this neglect and all this abuse, what do you think the fruits are of that? It manifests itself in many ways. My life was filled with darkness. And so here I am visiting her and I'm thinking, okay, I ask her the question, so I really want you to be honest. What was I like as a little boy? 
What she said just really blew my mind. Her response was this scripture. Her and her husband had thought that they were entertaining <laughs> angels unaware. So that completely blew my theory. At the age of 29, I had moved to Victoria for the second time, and I was really, really lonely. My dad had just died. My cat had died. I was probably lonelier than I'd ever been because I didn't have any friends. And I remember standing on the balcony thinking, I have to, once and for all, end it. I can't go on. And I had this really crystal clear thought. It wasn't a voice. And it said, Kirk, why don't you give me a chance? And I stood there and I thought, well, I've made a shipwreck of my life. I'll give you six months. <laughs> you know, I was just very ambivalent in my response. And I guess I have to say that... That's one of my favorite pictures, by the way, and I'm that little black lamb. I've never turned back. And I, before Christ, I was a prisoner of hopelessness. But now, because of this beautiful scripture, I love it, turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. And what a wonderful thing to be a prisoner of hope. And it was an interesting journey. So right after the balcony, and I made that deal with God, in those days I smoked a lot of pot. And God brings into my life a young man who also smokes a lot of pot. But the difference between this young man and, and other friends I'd had is this guy was searching for God. So him and I decided, well, let's, let's go to church. Well, what church do we go to? Oh, I had a good friend in art school. His name was Eddie. Eddie was a Pentecostal. Let's go there. So we would go off to the Pentecostal church. We did it for a while. So it was interesting. We would go to church, and then we'd come home and smoke a joint and just talk about God all afternoon. You know, <laughs> that's what we would do. Um, <laughs> so... I continued praying, and I'm really glad, I think my encounter with the Jehovah's Witnesses when I was a kid, that it made me very, very discerning. And it's a miracle I ever wound up in a church, actually, that preached about Jesus, because even though I believed their belief system was futile, I hung on to that as truth all those years. I believed they were the only ones that had truth. And it wasn't until I saw an ad in the paper, it was some sort of, uh, in Victoria, there was, I don't know, some meetings they were having in some auditorium. And I went to those meetings, and I went forward to an altar call, and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And that's a pretty strange thing for someone to do who's being brainwashed into the idea that Jesus was a created being, not divine, and to go and accept him as your savior. So anyway, I started going to the Baptist church because they were the ones that sponsored it. And I had a really great experience, but I remember I would be in the pew and every time they would say in Jesus' name, I would in my mind go, in Jehovah's name. That's what I believed. I had been brainwashed. And then somebody gave me a book, a little pamphlet, and I think it was called Masters of Deception. And this book set me free from the deceptions that I had come to believe. And at that time, I'm going to a Baptist church. Jehovah's Witnesses start visiting me now. So they're, they're visiting me. And then the building I had moved to, there was an ex-Adventist lady who lived in the building. She discerned that I was a young man looking for truth. So she sent a really obnoxious new convert to visit me. And this new convert, I tell you, I couldn't wait for him to get out of my home. I'm sorry to say that, but he comes into my home. I don't know him from Joe Blow, and he tells me I'm going to church on the wrong day. And I just couldn't wait for him to go. As soon as he left, 
I went to my dictionary and I looked up Saturday and it said seventh day of the week. I slammed that dictionary shut, I thought. Even the dictionary. <laughs> so thankfully, the young man didn't visit me anymore. Now the job was given to a youth pastor. So he would faithfully visit me every week, whether I wanted him to or not. And he would talk to me. He wanted to study with me, but I refused to study with anybody. And again, because I was so burnt from my experience with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyway, he didn't know that every week I'm going to the library and doing research on Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm learning all kinds of stuff. And I'm learning the right questions to ask him when I encounter him. And finally, five months into it, I said to him, I will let you give me, I will let you. I will have a study with you on the Sabbath, but I don't want to see footnotes. I want to see the original source material. I'm asking him to find the most obscure books, probably many of which were even out of print, you know, at the time. I'm asking him to load up his little car with all of these books because I want to see the original source material. Well, he got real excited, and I think his whole church was praying for me. Then I went to the library the next week before he was going to give me a presentation on the Sabbath, and it made a parallel between the origins of Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses. That's it. I didn't want anything more to do with it. So I called him up and I said, you can continue to visit me, but I don't want to study on the Sabbath. And I'll try to make a long story much shorter. Bottom line is, poor guy probably got really discouraged. They really stepped up their prayers. I was unemployed at the time, and I remember coming home one day, and in the front table of the apartment building I lived in, there was a Church of God publication. And the Church of God publication, I'm reading it. And I'm hungry. I want to know truth. And in this, I didn't know the Church of God, of course, at the time they kept Saturday for Sabbath. And what I'm reading about, it must have been a chapter on the Sabbath and the scripture that popped out off the page, Exodus 31, 17, that said, this shall be a sign between me and my people forever. It just jumped off the page. Anyway, I could go on, there's more to it, but I just have to say that at Dietrich's and my wedding, happiest day of my life, that in the day I was baptized, but there wasn't one person at our wedding that was related to me, and I frankly have never gone to a wedding where there wasn't representation from the bride and the groom's family. But you know, God did an amazing thing that day. The people that were there were his people. And his people are my people. It was in church for the first time that I experienced love. And I have to say, my wife's experience is different. She's had a loving family that she's in contact with. All her family were at the wedding. But I, probably more than most people I know, and it's probably going to be understandable to you, realize that our true family are those who do the will of the Father. You are my brothers. You are my sisters. So I do want to give you a little positive footnote, and that is that after my father passed away, my mother and I did have, for the next six years, a semblance of a relationship. And I do believe she loved me as much as she was able to do in the context of our past. The reason I put the Pilgrim's Progress up there is it was an audio dramatization that I had spent two and a half years working on in California. And I think it's nothing short of a miracle that my mother listened to it. And my mother was an atheist. And this is like listening to six and a half hours of sermons. And they're kind of intense, but it's in the guise of a story. And who knows, 
but that that recording was just done for her. I don't know. But I do know, as a result of her listening to it, I have hope that I will see her again. And my new sister, after she saw the poster of the story of my life, she said, there is a happy ending here, right? <laughs> yeah, there is a happy ending. And for me, she's part of it. So thank you.